Good morning, Governor Huntsman. This is uh, Vess. Vess, how are you, my friend? I'm doing well. We'll just give, uh, we'll just wait a couple more minutes, let some Great. few more people pop on, and then we'll get rolling. So, Terrific. Well, we'll cover whatever you'd like to cover. Awesome. Awesome. You got a great history. Thank you. You yeah. personally and the company. I'm sorry? You personally and the company. Well, thank you. We've worked hard over the years. The numbers tell the whole story. Yes. Incredible. Yeah. Thank you. I think we'll give it uh, one more minute, maybe two more minutes. I'll do a little intro. Um, and then what I'm thinking, Governor, is I've got a few questions for you uh, that we can go through. Um, you know, then we'll, we'll give you a little bit of time to, uh, you know, maybe explain some of your goals right now. Uh, and we'll kind of see where we're at after we do that. Does that, that work for you? Great. I'll just make a couple of comments about that and then we can go into whatever it is you would like. Perfect. <clears throat> Perfect. All good from your end. Okay, I think that we should go ahead and get started. So first of all, um, just so you know who's on, we have uh, teams of salespeople across 27 states, many of them, you know, residents of Utah, though, on the, on the call. We've got about 2,100 uh, salespeople out there. We've got branch managers on the call. We've got corporate staff here in Provo on the call. And we are going to uh, uh, record the Zoom meeting because some of the teams on the West Coast might not be up early enough to, uh, <laughs> to, to jump on. And so our goal is to uh, you know, share this with, with everyone in the company over the next day or two. So some people live, some people will get it a little bit uh, later. I did want to just say to, to the Aptiv family, uh, we're, we're going to break a record this month. And I don't think it's just an Aptiv record. I think it's like a service company all time record. Oh, we're going to add 110,000 customers this month, which I don't believe there's a service company in the US or maybe the world that is going to add 110,000 new customers in 30 days. Um, it's a pretty remarkable feat. And so I just want to congratulate uh, everybody uh, in the company for just what's an incredible June. And on top of that, we're doing it in a pandemic. We're doing it with civil unrest. And it's, it just kind of speaks to all of your determination and fortitude and just fight uh, that I think that we exhibit as a company. Governor Huntsman, we are honored to have you this morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Vess. It's a great pleasure. And please call me John. I'm not big on titles. Okay, I, I, will, I will do that. Well, just so everyone knows, um, John has worked with the previous five presidents in some capacity since Ronald Reagan. Uh, most recently, he was the ambassador 
uh, to Russia. He's been the ambassador to China. Those are the two, I believe, most important relations from a foreign policy standpoint that the U.S. has to maintain. And it's pretty amazing that, that presidents on both sides of the aisle have uh, picked John to uh, you know, maintain those, those relationships. Uh, John was the governor of Utah before he was asked by a president to go. And was it, was it China that you were asked to be the ambassador for? That's right. And uh, Utah was humming at the time. He did some amazing things uh, with the state before he went and took that job. Uh, John served on the boards of some of the biggest companies in the world. So his expertise and experience is not only in the political you know, sphere, uh, but also in the business sphere, which I think is a nice combo. Uh, so I just want to say that although this is not a, um, you know, necessarily meant to be a, a, a political form, uh, as, I've, as I've learned about John, as I've, uh, you know, met him and so on and so forth, I'm, I'm very impressed. And I do believe that uh, he would be a great person to lead our state uh, here in Utah. So, you know, with that, John, I'll let you kind of go over whatever you'd like to go over. And then I've got a few questions uh, really about leadership um, and maybe how people can grow in their careers. And then we'll kind of see where we're at. Great. Uh, Vess, I'm so excited to be with you and to be with the Apta family and uh, you know, to hear your numbers uh, and where you have come over the last uh, few years is just incredible. And uh, to think that you're going to hit the billion, billion bucks in revenue mark <clears throat> in the years ahead is uh, it speaks so well uh, of you and your team and the business model that you've got. So you're right. I've spent half my uh, career in the private sector. Uh, we started building Huntsman Corporation uh, when I was uh, just out of school. Uh, my dad, my brother, and just a few folks. Remember when we drove into Salt Lake Valley in 1973? My dad had been working for the federal government uh, the years before, and he was a big dreamer. And he had a big dream of building a company that, against all odds, maybe because when you're starting out with not a lot of money, you you rely on a lot of leverage and a lot of dreams and a lot of grit, and. Uh, was to build something, and if we were successful, it uh, was to see what we could do to give back to the communities that allowed us to prosper. And then beyond that, it was to engage in public service if we were really lucky enough, uh, and nobody ever knew where life would go at that point. And uh, I, I, I miss my dad a lot. He passed on a little over two years ago. He was a fighter and a gambler, and our earliest lessons in finance were, were at the craps table uh, play, playing cards and money. And uh, um, I, I learned a whole lot from him. So I, I'm running for governor again. And I like to think that being governor is a lot less politics and a lot more public service. And the, the issues that you focus on are really kind of business related. Because if you can't make a state go, it's a little bit like um, a, a company. If you can't pay the bills, if you can't look at the balance sheet and uh, see where the revenue is going to come from and accelerate the revenue, uh, you're going to lose. And some other state's going to do better than you. Uh, and that's unacceptable. And I found out as governor before, any successful governor has to keep their eye on the revenue stream. And that means you got to look at pro-growth policies. It's pretty simple. You got to look at your tax code. They've got to be competitive. Uh, you got to look at your regulatory environment, because if you're regulating people out of business, uh, they're going to flee. And that's exactly what's happening in states like California, for example. One of the reasons that we've become one of the fastest growing states in America is because people can't retire in California. They can't start businesses there, and they're voting with their feet. That's just how the free market works. And I love the free market. It tells you everything you need to know about freedom and liberty and good policies. If they don't exist where you live, you're gonna pack up your bags and you're gonna go someplace else. So for me, this go around, you know, and I would encourage any of you who are voters in the state of Utah to get out and do your, do your duty to vote. Having lived in Moscow and Beijing and places like that, you know, where people just dream of voting, we kind of take it for granted. A lot of people don't get out and vote. They don't get excited about elections, but we forget that most people in the world don't have that luxury. They'd love to be able to do that, but they just can't. Uh, so for me, this election is not dissimilar from what I did before as governor. So I came into office last time with a 10 point plan that I'd cooked up with small business, big business, entrepreneurs, innovators, people who really wanted the marketplace to hum. 
because our biggest export at the time was our talent, our young people. We'd love them, raise them, nurture them, pay for their education in public schools, and then they'd leave to go to better markets. And I wanted this to be the go-to market. So we rebranded the state of Utah, Life Elevated, which still remains. We completely redid our tax code and we delivered the first flat tax in the history of the United States. Uh, it took us two years to get it done, but the vote in the legislature was 100 to zero. We got every Republican, every Democrat, probably because everybody was equally upset with the content because nobody agreed fully, but that's how things get done. Uh, we uh, created the Governor's Office of Economic Development as well, which is kind of the key go-to economic development uh, uh, apparatus for the state of Utah. And then we, we stood up things like the World Trade Center and uh, a whole bunch of other things. And it's pretty much been the same for 15 years, and uh, we've had really good growth years. And my argument this go around is for us to achieve our maximum potential as a state, not that state government grows, it's entrepreneurs and innovators who do the growing, but state government does have a lot to do with how competitive your overall marketplace is. That's what they should be focused on. Uh, we need a 2.0. We need to update who we are, how the world sees us, and begin to freshen up our marketplace. So I, I see Utah as being in a very unique position to establish itself as a crossroads of the world. We should be looking at ourselves as world-class in everything we do. I think that's where we are in history. I grew up thinking that Utah was the crossroads of the West. That's what we used to talk about. But you know what, today, no, no more. Uh, whether it's the economy or whether it's education, we should see ourselves as world-class and that should inform everything we do. So I put forward a plan just like Vess would do on the growth side of a business. So what are your accelerators? What can you focus on to derive more revenue and bring more uh, investment and capital into the state? Well, here's my basic premise. My basic premise is because of COVID-19, which I'm just recovering from, I had it for the last two weeks. Now my wife has it and I've got two others in my home that do. Uh, whether it's the global marketplace, whether it's our domestic marketplace, I think we're in a state of confusion which should benefit our, our state. And let me explain, let me explain how. Uh, I think we're gonna see the largest migration of labor and capital and manufacturing we have seen uh, internationally in, uh, since World War II. And peop some people are gonna benefit from this. The people with the most competitive states are gonna benefit from where the capital goes, where the manufacturing goes, and where the brain power goes. And I wanna be in a position to stand up and say, this market, Utah, is a safe haven uh, in the world, this is the place you want to park your capital, this is the place you want to park your ideas and your manufacturing. And I think by doing that, there's no reason why we can't double our state's GDP. Right now we're sitting at about 180 billion bucks a year and, and my goal is to get it to 500 billion bucks over the next 10 years. And, and I know that's totally possible, uh, knowing how uh, trade flows work and investment flows and where some of the major markets like China are going, they're losing a lot of their luster. So that's the big play for me uh, on the economic side. So how are you gonna pay the bills as a state? I know Vess is always thinking about that with the leadership team. You got bills to pay, you've got revenue to derive to cover that. The state's no different. You gotta have revenue coming in to cover your costs for education, for transportation, for human services, and they're pretty big. And if your revenue doesn't work, <clears throat> nothing else works. <clears throat> so that, that's issue number one. Issue number two is a focus on, on mental health. And uh, un unfortunately, Utah has become the buckle of the suicide belt in the United States. And <clears throat> there, <clears throat> pardon me, there's a whole lot more that we can do in terms of raising awareness about this. And, and I want to declare war on this insidious problem and, and lead the state in a discussion to kind of demystify what, what mental illness is. For me, it's a personal deal. My sister died of uh, drug, drug overdose exactly 10 years ago, and it was preceded by a lot of uh, mental illness that we recognized but didn't know what to do about it. We didn't want to talk to anybody about it because it was, it was just too personal. And, uh, uh, and uh, after a while, a beautiful human being is lost. And uh, I know that every home and every neighborhood, every community, not just in this state, but so many others, they, they, they suffer from the same challenges. And there's so much more that we can do. And I want to start looking at mental health as we do education, as we do water, which is to say to have a long-term plan, because we don't have a long-term plan right now. We don't know how many psychiatrists we need in the state. We don't know how many nurse practitioners are needed. We don't know what kind of support we need in the schools where the suicide rate 
is a leading cause of death now among those in the 10 to 25 year old age cohort, if you can believe that. So it's, it's a huge challenge. And again, this isn't a, a, a Republican, a Democrat, or red or blue, a Fox News, MSNBC issue. This is just ours. And we just need to pull together as people who are really concerned about this uh, and tackle it. And it's going to take the governor's bully pulpit to get out to talk about it, to bring faith-based business, healthcare providers, education, everyone who has a stake in this together to begin to discuss it and to demystify it in ways that people feel a little more comfortable discussing uh, uh, circumstances that may be very close to home. And, and again, I, I'm driven based upon my personal motivation because it, it is a very personal issue to me. And it is a very personal issue to a lot of other people I've discussed this with around the state. So for us, we are driving to the finish line of our primary election here with uh, the goal of doubling our state's economic output is our goal number one. And I put forward a pretty elaborate roadmap, a plan in terms of how we can get that done. Uh, and then mental health is really the second one that uh, is a focus for me. And you know what you do in, in politics? It's the ultimate free market uh, uh, environment. You get out and you make your arguments, you put forward your best ideas, you have debates as we've already done. You take the shots, the slings and arrows, and you know it, it can be a, a pretty dirty environment, uh, politics, unfortunately. And then you let the people vote, and that's exactly what's happening uh, starting last week, and it will end on Tuesday. So we're very excited about this, and I love our form of government, uh, that our, our form of electing leaders more than ever before, because I've seen in Russia how it is not allowed and how many yearn for this kind of thing. And I've seen in China run by the Communist Party uh, where there is no ability to speak out. There is no choice. There is no ability to petition your government. Uh, so this is a beautiful process, flawed as it might be. It's ours and it's up to us to keep refining it and perfecting it as we go. So Vess, I'm just delighted with the few minutes you've given me to stand on the soapbox and uh and i and i really appreciate it well thank you we we appreciate you being here and so a few a few questions for you john you know, you've as i mentioned earlier you've worked among or with the, the last you know five presidents um it's often said that you know the president of the united states may be the most powerful person in the world but what have you learned from a leadership perspective, having worked, uh, you know, with the with these men? Well, I, I started with uh, President Reagan, and uh, I, I was a low-level White House aide uh, traveling around with him uh, back in his first term, and I had no idea that he would loom large in later years. We just loved him because he was such a genuine and, and authentic guy, and uh, I later served on on the board. Uh, of his uh, library right up to when he passed and then when Nancy, his wife passed. And it was a great honor to, to help preserve that legacy. Um, and, and he, his management style was uh, open. It was engaging. He had been governor of California. He had been an actor of all things before that. Uh, and what was special about him is he carried the majesty of uh, Amer American values and ideals. He was optimistic. Uh, he was inclusive. Uh, he always had his note cards in front of him whenever he sat in a meeting and he'd refer to note cards and he always got criticized for that. But, but that was the way he kind of organized his thinking. But what was unique about his management style is nobody ever questioned what he stood for because he had a very simple view. I'm gonna end the Cold War. That's one of my primary goals and that's exactly what he did. And I'm going to build the economy through tax reform. Remember the, the, the Kemp Roth tax cuts during his period. And I, I'm going to accelerate growth so that we can afford to beat the Soviet Union ultimately. And he did that. And he, and he, worked, and he wanted to preserve freedom, uh, which, of course, was a, a, a big mantra of his. So everything he said, everything he did, everywhere he went, that's what he talked about. And it was so interesting, the best because I went to China with him in the early 1980s, my first, my first trip to China, although I'd lived in Taiwan before that. And, uh, and uh, they put him on television in front of a billion people. And, uh, and I'll be darned if he didn't you know, talk about American freedom and liberty. And I'm sure that the censors were going crazy because in a communist environment, that's not what you want to talk about. But high marks to the Chinese, even in the early days, 
for allowing a president of the United States to go live on uh, on television. So that that was that was his style, and I compare and con contrast that with with later presidents who brought different experiences in, into the presidency, just like CEOs. CEOs all come from different backgrounds, and they all have strengths and weaknesses. And uh, in, in working uh, for uh, George W. Bush uh, as his trade ambassador, uh, he's the first CEO we ever ever had as president, and he brought those management principles to the Oval Office which meant that he ran his cabinet meetings and his staff meetings pretty much like a business meeting. And he was more focused on bottom line results. Uh, and for him, that was his style. He was a different communicator than Ronald Reagan. He didn't enjoy communicating as much. And in, in the presidency, it's all about communicating. You're either a really good communicator or you're not. And, and then I fast forward to President Trump, who I met 20 years ago. And you know, people say, well, you know, his style, you know, drives me crazy. Some people really like it, but, but it is who he is. He comes from the hard bitten developer community in New York City. And that's a pretty rough playground. And uh, he never was in politics before, never in elective office, never served in the armed forces. Uh, so there was no reason to think that he would become president and all of a sudden begin to talk like a politician. That's just not his orientation. So he does what, <laughs> what he does naturally. And uh, some people like it and some people don't. He's also really focused on goals. And I think that's part of the business background that he has. Uh, it's all bottom line focus. He looks at the numbers. He looks at, he's the first president I've ever seen who looks at trade statistics and he'll look at a trade imbalance and say, okay, uh, you've got a surplus with us. Maybe there's something wrong with that. Maybe we've got to renegotiate a trade deal. And so whether it was NAFTA, whether it was our trade agreements with Korea or ongoing trade agreements with China, he's kind of ripped them all up and he's trying to do them over again in ways that uh, uh, better balance uh, our, our trade flows, which I give my marks for because having negotiated some of these trade agreements, they're really complicated. Some of them are dated. Many of them don't take into account the changes that have occurred economically and technology and things like that. So he brings his own unique style uh, as well. But uh, we can go on and on about this and Vess, I'll, I'll, I'll end it right there. Awesome, well just one, one follow-up question. I'm, I'm curious, some people believe that Bill Clinton is one of the most effective communicators of this generation. Just from a, a, a communication standpoint, what, what, did, what did you learn being around him? He uh, didn't spend any time in the private sector. So he had been governor of Arkansas. He had been attorney general in Arkansas before that. And he was a very successful governor. Uh, and he ran at a very, very young age. Uh, he was a masterful politician because he was a masterful communicator. In fact, I would put him in the category of, of Reagan in the sense that he had an ability to speak in ways that inspired people. And, and I've been around him. So I, when Coretta Scott King passed away, uh, the wife of Martin Luther King, I was one of the, the few governors who was invited to attend that because I'd known one of the daughters of uh, Martin Luther King. And, and Bill Clinton was the speaker there. And he stood up without any notes and gave the most impressive funeral speech uh, I, I'd ever heard. And it was all from the heart. Uh, he practiced it as governor for probably I, two or three terms he was governor. And he just had an ability uh, to, to inspire and motivate through words. Now, the flip side of that, he wasn't able to combine sometimes the management technique that some other president, presidents had to kind of follow on with, with the soaring rhetoric. So some presidents have an ability to soar with their words and to inspire, but they're not great managers, which maybe you know, surprises some people. You are, uh, you are an aggregator of talent as president, as a governor. And how good you will do in large measure is dependent upon the quality of people that you bring in uh, to play some of those key management roles, uh, overseeing huge departments and agencies that are critically important to the functioning of our, of our U.S. government. Awesome. Well, thank you. Maybe just a couple more questions. And you, you found yourself at one point on the world's biggest stage inside of a presidential debate. The lights are bright, uh, a lot of pressure. Uh, what, what advice can you deal or can you provide when dealing with, you know, big time pressure and maybe a lot of eyeballs on you? Well, it's interesting you would bring that up because, <laughs> you know, I've always said, you know, everyone's entitled to one big mistake in life. And 
you know, I ran for president. That was my big mistake in life. <laughs> uh, we, we ran up to third place in New Hampshire, which was, which was pretty cool. Um, but standing on the stage, you know, in front of millions of people, uh, the first thing that comes to mind, you look on the stage at those who are also running for president and you say, for the greatest country in the history of the world, the country that produced Abraham Lincoln, uh, this is the best we can do. <laughs> You know, you, 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 look to, you look at the folks <clears throat> who run typically and you say, would you want them on your board of directors? Would you want them running your company? And uh, in politics, you, you get what you get. And most people are not willing to step into the arena because it's painful and it's difficult. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real slog and it's difficult on your family as well. But the only thing you, you really do think about is how do I stay focused on the goal? I've got a goal. I can't divert my thinking from that. Every day is a different strategy that you've got to lead, uh, live in, in, in working toward ultimately that goal. What can happen in the, in the fog of war, which is, uh, which is a campaign, is you lose that focus and you begin to follow things that are less important and they take you down uh, alleyways that are a waste of time uh, and you, you lose that focus on the goal. So what I take from that experience, what I take from running the, the two largest and most important embassies in the world is you've got goals to achieve. You have goals to achieve with Aptiv. Uh, and everything you do, every, every waking hour should be focused on ultimately what those goals are, how I'm gonna achieve those goals, the kind of rhythm I need to establish with the team, uh, and what, what, kind of, what, what kind of strategy I need uh, in order to get there. The minute you take your eye off the goal, you start wasting time and that goal becomes ever elusive. And it's no different in presidential politics. You gotta stay focused on the goal. I love that. We definitely have a culture of education, self-improvement. What, what books have you read lately uh, that you would recommend uh, to the Aptiv family? You know, I like, I like books on leadership. So uh, I read books on, on Abraham Lincoln, and, and there are many. I read books on Winston Churchill. Uh, I, I love reading up on people who have lived through difficult times, and uh, no more so than Winston Churchill during World War II, and whether it's Gilbert's biography uh, on, on Churchill, that, that's a great one. Uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's many on Lincoln, particularly his ability when he won just as the Civil War was getting started in, in the election of 1860. Uh, and he basically took all of his rivals. And, you know, it had been a really bitter campaign that year. And what did he do? He put, you know, everyone from Seward, uh, who became Secretary of State right on through, to, to constitute his team, which if you look back on it, was an unbelievable management principle. So he took uh, a very difficult political environment, which was made a whole lot worse because the Civil War was just breaking out and we were separating North and South. And he brought them in and formed a coalition. And it's like th Lincoln, although you know, he had a much different communicating style, um, he, he, he was quiet for the most part. He was deliberative, he was thoughtful. There's one really interesting book on, uh, on Lincoln called Lincoln's Melancholy. Uh, and he, he probably suffered from depression uh, during uh, a lot of his leadership years. But what he did spoke volumes, uh, bringing in his opponents, making them part of the leadership team, and making decisions like the Emancipation Proclamation, which we've just been talking a whole lot about this last week, against all odds. And you look back on some of these lessons in leadership, and they're pretty, they're pretty profoundly important. Well, thank you. Well, that last question, and most people on this call are, you know, somewhat early in their career. They're trying to make a name for themselves. They're trying to figure out, uh, you know, what direction their, their life from a work standpoint is going to go. What, what advice would you give uh, these people? Take a risk. This is what makes America great. A lot of other places around the world, don't allow someone to stand up and take a risk. Your life just goes on and you don't have the freedom of movement, of decision-making, of choice to be able to do something special. So b both of my sons went to the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis and now they're, they're both active duty naval officers. One flies super hornets off of aircraft carriers. He just returned from the Middle East. And uh, the other is a platoon leader in a special operations uh, 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 outfit in, uh, deployed in Asia right now. 
And they both had to memorize something really important when they went to the Naval Academy, where your first year you're a plebe, you're lower than dirt, and they just make life miserable for you. And they had to memorize that saying by Theodore Roosevelt called Man in the Arena. And this has become something that all members of the Huntsman family uh, get to know by heart. Uh, you have a choice in life. You can either step in the arena and you can take the criticism, the slings and arrows, uh, and the difficulty of being uh, a, a leader or taking a risk, or you can stand on the, on the sidelines and be a cold and callous critic who knows neither victory nor defeat. I think for decisions, whether they're in business or whether they're in politics, it's no different. You either make a choice uh, to step in the arena, to take a risk, to be bold, to go big, or you choose to stand on the sidelines. And you know what? If you choose to do that, you'll be forever questioning why you, why you did that. So in America, in our, in our culture, in our society, you can take a risk and you can determine in your own life how big you want that to be, how big you want to go. So for those who are thinking about their career ahead, don't be timid, don't be shy. And I'll just end with this thought because I think it's an important one. You know, how much of what we do in life is limited by fear? So much of our decision is, decision making is, uh, is, is based on the fear factor. We don't do things because we fear we might fail. We, we fear we might be criticized. We fear we might get a bad tweet. I've got a great friend by the name of Travis Pastrana, who's one of the great motorcycle riders in the world, and I've known Travis for a long time. He was the first human being to do a double backflip on a motorcycle, and he did it in the X Games in Mexico City. He, he's out with a great commercial endorsing our campaign, and, and, and I, love, I love Travis. And he's a very embodiment of risk. He's probably broken every bone in his body. Not that I'm recommending you do that. <laughs> but there are some people who say, I'm going big, I'm going high, I, I'm, I'm going to put it all on the line, and they do that. And, uh, and they break records, uh, and uh, they don't let fear stand in the way. So all I would say is when you're thinking about your future, when you're thinking about decisions, don't let fear cloud your thinking. Think how much we would do and how far we would go if fear was not a factor at all. So take it out of your brain, dismiss it completely, and go big. I love that. I, I've got a, a, a picture in my office. Um, it just says, fear nothing. There's, there's three other things on there as well, but fear, fear nothing. We also share a love of and admiration of Abraham Lincoln and his leadership. He had such a, uh, just a, a thoughtful um, way of leading. He was such an amazing listener. Well, we appreciate uh, your time, Governor. You're in the final sprint here. Every, yeah, we minute, are. <laughs> every minute counts. And so for us to get 30 of them uh, is a tremendous honor. And we really, we really appreciate that. So thank you for your, your wisdom, your leadership, uh, your, your thoughts on leadership. It's been uh, a great experience for us. So best of luck thank these you, final few days. Thanks to the Aptive team. I'd love to join you again sometime. Perfect. Right on. Okay. Have a great day. Take care.